What is up, Church by the Glades? If you missed last week, we had so much fun last week. We, we jumped into this unique conversation, who would Jesus vote for? And we had a lot of fun, a lot of fun. If you're a guest, I'm David, I'm one of the pastors, and we're thrilled you're with us. This week is gonna be a lot of fun. And if you missed last week, you might be tense, thinking, should a church talk about this? Hey, relax, take a breath, say a prayer, no judgment zone, we're gonna have a good time, amen? Yeah. All campuses, and if you missed, missed last week, you can watch the, uh, the, the message online, churchbytheglades.com, but I, I'll cut to the, the chase. We landed here, this is a huge choice. I mean, America is making a choice come November of, of a president. We are electing the next leader of the free world. That, that's a staggeringly large choice, but to put it in proper perspective, as Christian people, we recognize we're electing a president. We're not choosing a savior. Our, our God never runs for re-election. He is sovereign, he is supreme, he's always on the throne. Whether you vote for him or don't vote for him, he's in control. And that is a great comfort for people of faith. And it is a huge blessing that we get to choose our leaders. You recognize for the vast majority of human history that civilizations, people groups, have not chosen their leaders, they just had someone in charge, typically uh, an individual, may they call it a, a, a tribal chieftain, maybe a, a regional warlord, maybe they were called Pharaoh or Caesar or Emperor Khan or often kings. And kings, you didn't vote to the throne, didn't vote them off the throne. I mean, they took the power. In fact, kings ascended the throne typically by bloodline or bloodshed. In fact, if you want a fun read, there are two books in the Old Testament named Kings, First Kings, Second Kings, and they're the records of the kings of Israel and the kings of Judah. The kings of Judah ascended the throne typically by bloodline. Almost all were direct descendants of King David, the best king, the biblical benchmark for kings. But in Israel, bloodshed. Dynasties were typically very short-lived. There's all kinds of chaos and coups and conspiracies and assassinations and wow. So kings took the power. People didn't have a voice, but we have a voice. In fact, there are still kings ruling as late as the, you know, the 20th century. Uh, the Kaiser in Germany, uh, the Tsars in Russia. Uh, Japan had an emperor until the 1940s. Throughout history, a host of tyrants and dictators and furors and stuff. We are so blessed. We get to choose our leaders. What an amazing freedom our forefathers secured for us. We get to choose our leaders, and if we don't like our leaders in four years, we can fire them. That's a great blessing, amen? You're quiet, man, that's awesome. Do you wanna live under a king or live where we choose our leaders? Put your hands together, man. I wanna choose who leads me. Grateful to be part of this unique American experiment. All right, so if you're here last week, we talked about just how, how a thinking person, an intelligent person, we were thinking about how a thinking person should think about the election. I wanna narrow the scope of the conversation. Last week, whether you were a God follower or not, I think the conversation obviously relevant and it will be today if you're here and you're not yet a Christian person, but I wanna to talk to the person of faith. How should a person of faith, how should a Christian person frame the political question before us? How should we prioritize our values if you, like me, are a Christ follower? I think this is kinda of simple, kinda of obvious, but I wanna put it out there. I think if you're a person of faith, your faith should come first, then your politics. Faith one, politics. In fact, everything else, too. When Jesus said, seek ye first the kingdom of God and God's righteousness, and then all these other things, so my faith comes first, then my politics. It would be like, I I'm a Democrat first, uh, actually, I I'm a Christian first, then I'm a Democrat. I I'm a person of faith, and then I'm a Republican. You, you tracking with me? So that's the way I would write. My faith would come first, then my politics. If for no other reason, nobody here in this room on your deathbed is gonna call a loved one over at the hospital and say, please, please, before I die, read me a few verses from the Bill of Rights. Nobody does that. You might want someone to read you know, God's promises over you as you transition to the next life. But nobody, right? Nobody, when you die, when you die, you're not hoping to go to Washington, D.C. You're hoping to go to heaven. So uh, for that reason alone, I think faith first, politics Second, now here's the crazy thing. Our church, you probably notice, is very, very diverse. There's some churches you go to in America, and it's not a bad thing, it's just a thing, but the whole church, everybody kind of looks and feels the same. 
Like everybody's the same age, it's a senior adult, late in church, or a very young church, maybe most people the same race, go out to the, go out to the, the parking lot, everybody drives the same minivan. Our church, you guys are screwed up, man. We're mixed up, we're all over the place. We're multiracial, we're multicultural, we're multigenerational, and when it comes to our politics, we're all over the place. We have some excellent elephant people, we have some dedicated donkey people in the house. You're passionate. You have strong feelings. We're not this homogenous church. But here's the crazy thing. Whether you're Republican, Democrat, or something else, you would probably say, well, the reason I'm a Republican is I'm a Christian. I think the Republican Party aligns best with the Christian worldview. But someone else sitting next to you might say, no, 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 the reason I'm a Democrat is I think that expresses my faith. My faith is the reason why I'm an independent. And we go to the Bible trying to make our case. In fact, you turn to a John chapter 12. John chapter 12 is the primary text. Just to make sure you're awake today, let's all say that text together loudly. Ready? John chapter. Uh, excellent voice, all campuses. Find John chapter 12. We're going to bounce around the scripture. I'll land there in a few moments. But maybe you're here and you're saying, well, I'm a Republican, and obviously uh, Jesus was a Republican. Now, where do you find that in the Bible? You say, well, if you turn to Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 5, go to the, uh, the authorized King James Version, uh, circa 1611. If you read the narrative carefully, it says in Luke chapter 5, after these things, Jesus went forth and saw a, he saw a publican, saw a publican named Levi or Matthew sitting at the receipt of customs as the IRS house, and he said unto him, follow me. And he left all and rose up, very cool, and followed him. And Levi made a great feast at his own house. It was like a dinner party, his own house. And there was a great company of publicans. There it is. It's almost exactly in the Bible verbatim. Jesus is hanging out with the publicans. He's at a dinner party. It's the, the publican party. So Jesus is a Republican. Someone else going, oh, no, 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 no. Jesus, Jesus, definitely a Democrat. Jesus was a Democrat. I mean, he's always going around dispensing free health care. Democrat. He loves poor people. Democrat. Please don't quote me out of context. Someone else, you're, 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 you're a libertarian. You're a libertarian. Any libertarians in the house? We had some last night. Woo, woo. A vocal libertarian down here on the front row. Oh, you're like, well, he's obviously a libertarian. What's the most famous thing Jesus ever said? I, I would argue when he said that thing about truth, that you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you... Free, free as in freedom, as in freedom, or it's synonym, liberty, li libertarian. Jesus is a libertarian. We spend all this time trying to get you know, God on our side. I think the more important question, are we on his side? And Jesus, if you read the Gospels, they try to put him in a political camp more than a few times. They try to get Jesus to take a side on a politically charged question, and he always kind of evaded that stuff. Remember when he was asked about taxation? There were different political parties in Israel. There was the Herodians. They were kind of aligned with the Romans. They thought the Roman government brought stability and they were pro-Roman tax. But most of the people, like the Pharisees, were anti-Roman. They hated the tax. Hey, Jesus, uh, should we be paying the taxes to Rome or not? You know, Levi's collecting taxes for Rome. I think it's immoral and wrong. What do you think, Jesus? He said, show me, show me a coin. Whose image is on there? Uh, uh, Caesar's. Okay, here's, here's my thought. Once you give to Caesar everything that's Caesar's, but give to God everything that's God's, and I'm way more concerned about what you render to God. And, and he wouldn't let himself get trapped. So, uh, you know, you're trying to get Jesus on your side? Be sure you're trying to be on his side. So we're choosing a leader. Bible's helpful. There's a litany of leaders in the scripture. There's a plethora of people in power. They ascend the throne, and, and some are good leaders, and a few are extraordinary leaders, and there's a whole bunch of really bad leaders, and you can learn from all of that. And again, listen, I know this can be a tense conversation, but thank you for being mature and understanding, and I know you're passionate. Our church is diverse. We got our donkey people. We got our elephant people. And if you missed last week, I did my best on the stage to make sure you realized our God is bigger than all that. He does not ride the backs of donkeys nor elephants. Amen? Amen. So let's have a fun conversation about leadership. We're looking for a leadership. Who would Jesus vote for? What are the qualities of a leader? Well, I wish we had time because there's so many examples in the Bible. But let me pick today just three. 
Three qualities of a good leader that are celebrated in the Bible, all kinds of qualities of inside and intellect and experience and skill set, but three things, no matter where you lead, not just politically, you lead in business, you lead on the athletic team, you apply these qualities, you'll be a better leader and you'll be easier to follow. Here's the first one. I'm gonna give you three qualities and three biblical examples of a leader who personifies this quality. Number one, something called moral authority. Moral authority. When I say three, loudly say those two words. Ready? One, two, three. Moral authority. Dave, Dave, David, what is that? Well, the Bible's huge on authority. A lot of us have authority issues. We, we resist authority. Guess what, man? You, sh you shouldn't be that way. The Bible wants us to submit to authority. We quickly looked at a verse in Romans last week. You, you stay in John chapter, uh, chapter, chapter 12, but in Romans chapter 13, verse one, the apostle Paul says this is about the government, and the government at the time is the Roman government, not a very popular government, kind of an oppressive government, and the leader at the time was Nero, not a good leader, kind of a wicked leader, but it says this, Paul writing to Christian people in Rome, everyone must submit. submit. Bible talks a lot about submission. Kids submitting to their parents, submitting to each other in love and marriage. It's submission, right? But a lot of us, submission, that's, that's the S word, submission. Well, I, I don't like submitting to authority. Well, God leverages authority. What if I don't like the authority? What if it's a flawed authority system? Even still, God can utilize and leverage a flawed authority system. So here's the Roman government. Everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities for there is no authority except that which God has established. Is this saying that every government is godly? No, no. But God can use authority systems. Now, bad leaders might lead from a position of power. They may have a, uh, a, a platform of designated authority. And they lead because of their title or they lead because of their clout. But the best leaders don't lead from a platform of designated authority. They lead from a position of moral authority. What's, what's moral authority? It's simply this. A close alignment between your belief and your behavior. It's, 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 it's you do what you declare. It is, it's, in my line, they call it you practice what you preach. There's consistency between your proclamation and your choices and character. There's a seamless relationship between public life and private life. Consistency, moral authority. If you practice what you preach, you'll be a more effective leader. Even if people disagree, it's harder to resist your arguments if they see consistency in your character. I don't care where it is in life, if you lead from a vantage point of moral authority, you're an easier leader to follow. Let me show you a great example in the Bible, a guy named Nehemiah. When I say three, loudly say the name Nehemiah. Ready? One, two, three. Nehemiah. Great name, of Nehemiah, Nehemiah. It's a short little story tucked away in the Old Testament. Uh, Israel had all kinds of issues when he was the governor. He wasn't the king, but he was the guy in power. King Artaxerxes gave him authority in Israel, and Israel had been in bad circumstances for decades and decades. The economy was in shambles, and the main problem was the protective wall that every capital city had was, in, it was decimated. And you had to have that protective perimeter wall to, to be a you know, substantial people group back then. And leaders before Nehemiah had come to Jerusalem and attempted to rebuild the wall, and they all failed. Nehemiah comes back. If you'd like to study leadership, you need to read the book. In a mere 52 days, under the leadership of Nehemiah, God's people rebuilt this mighty wall. Typically, it would take 52 years now, someone's going, well, uh, he probably had one of those God miracles up his sleeve, right? He probably was one of those walk on the water guys, burning bush guys. No, there's no overt God miracle in the book of Nehemiah. No doubt there's a subtle power of God undergirding everything, but it's mainly the study of how God can utilize a good leader. Nehemiah is a vision caster, he is courageous, he models behavior, he's a strategic thinker, he's a good communicator, but the main thing he had Moral authority. I'll give you a couple examples quickly. Um, leaders before him had tried to rebuild the wall and they had all failed. Here's the reason why. The leader would show up in Jerusalem and say, look at the walls, man. The walls are terrible. The walls have been decimated. We need to rebuild the walls. So all you poor people, start building. All you peasant population, you start building the walls. And, and the rich people didn't get busy with it. Nehemiah came to town and said, all you poor people, you're gonna build the wall. 
All you middle class people, you're gonna build the wall. All you rich people, you're getting your hands dirty. You're gonna help build the wall. Now, they would resist it, except the moment he said that, he put on his tool belt and his hard hat, and the governor went out and did physical labor every single day. See the credibility of practicing what you preach? My guess is the nobles didn't like the fact they had to work, but it's hard to argue with a leader that has moral authority. Another example, Nehemiah chapter five. You guys are quiet today. Nehemiah chapter five. Say a text together loudly for homework. Ready? Nehemiah chapter five. Read that if you're a leader. If you're a leader, it's a great study in leadership. What, what's the problem? Well, the wall was problem number one. But the economy, there was this recession. It was, it was horrible. It was so bad, especially in the lower classes. People at the poverty line were selling themselves as slaves to, uh, to, to pay debts. And they were selling themselves to slaves to fellow Jews, a violation of Mosaic law. When Nehemiah, Nehemiah heard this, he, he blew his lid. He was angry. He declared, you can't have a fellow Jew as a slave. All the slaves are now set free. If they owe you outstanding debt, too bad. Too, canceling all debts. Now, if you were a debtor, you're like, yeah. But if people owed you a bunch of money, you're like, wait a minute, wait a minute, Nehemiah. But if you read in chapter five, there's almost no pushback. Why? Nehemiah, for the 12 years, he's the government, governor of Jerusalem, refuses to collect any taxes to pay his own salary. He pays himself for over a decade. More than that, he had 150 people on staff. He paid all their salaries out of, out of his own pocket. You see how that would make him hard to argue with? He may not like his economic policies, but when he's that engaged, that'd be, that'd be like whoever we elect to pres as president, that he or she would come to the office and say, for the next four years, don't pay my salary. In fact, I'll pay the salaries of everyone on the White House stack. I'll pay the salaries of all the Congress and the Senate and all federal employees. That won't happen, but if that happened, <laughs> it'd be hard to argue with that leader. Moral authority, practice what you preach, it makes you a better president, it makes you a better pastor, it makes you a better parent, amen? amen? See, logical leadership principles here. Nehemiah models this. Okay, here, here, here's one. I think a good leader should be disciplined, should be disciplined. Say the word discipline. One, two, three, discipline. Now, I don't mean merely personal discipline, though that's important. Leaders who lack self-control always damage their leadership and their legacy. But I mean this, um, Discipline in the way they run government or an organization. Financial discipline. Uh, America, I would argue, is a, is a very, very blessed country. We are not without our problems. We're not without our poor. But relative to other nations in the world, ours is a very prosperous nation overall. We have our issues, but overall, relative to other countries, throughout history especially, we are a prosperous people. Now, some of you... You have problems and they're real and you feel anxiety, but your problems are, are prosperous people problems. I mean, if you ever complained and your complaint began like this, uh, my hairstylist, that girl who does my nails, my landscaper, my pool guy, oh, my vacation home, blah, blah, blah. Those are prosperous people problems, you understand, right? There's somebody here going, well, I don't have me a vacation home, Pastor Dave, and I don't have me a hairstylist, and, and I can't afford supercuts. And I, okay, do you have a car? Do you have a car? Well, I have a car, but it's, it's, it's a clunker, man. It's a, it's a banger. It's, I have this old car. It breaks down all the time. You know, only 8 to 10% of the world's adult population owns a car. You're probably more blessed than you realize. So as a blessed people... As a prosperous people, sometimes though we're blessed, when you're prosperous, you can be a little sloppy and, and lack a little discipline, and though you have a lot, you want more, so what do you do, just go borrow? A lot of our families, we're in debt right now, and we have maxed out credit cards, right? Your, your kids, your kids, the more you give your kids, they don't grow more grateful, they want more, right? And so that happens when a people is prosperous. The most prosperous nation in the Old Testament early on is Egypt, Egypt. Genesis 41, there's a leader, his name is Pharaoh. Now typically if you read about the Pharaohs in the Bible, they're the bad guys, but this Pharaoh is a pretty good leader. Egypt is prosperous. Why is Egypt so prosperous? Probably the ge ge uh, geographic location of Egypt, you know, is there on the Nile Delta, and the Nile River brings all these nutrients and minerals from the interior of the continent, and so the, the soil is really fertile in Egypt, and so their crops just really prosper and do well year in and year out. So they're, they're the richest and most powerful nation in the world in Genesis chapter 41. But this Pharaoh receives information from God by way of a dream. 
Anybody here ever have a weird dream? Anybody have a weird dream this week? Yeah, like weird, weird. My wife, she's not in the room, but Lisa has the weirdest dreams, man. She has the weirdest dreams, and she tells me, guys, like every day in detail about her weird dreams. Now, if you're having a weird dream, that's probably not a dream from God. That's probably that burrito you ate too late last night. But old, old Pharaoh, the leader, has this dream, and it is a divine dream. It's God trying to speak to him. He needs some help to understand, so he calls a young Hebrew former slave, former prisoner named Joseph. And Joseph gives him the interpretation of this dream. And, and here's the dream. Hey, things are good right now, Pharaoh, but for seven years, seven, it's gonna be better. Egypt is prosperous now. Our crops are good, but seven years, economic explosion, economic, it's gonna be so good. We're gonna have so much. The rich are gonna get rich. Oh, it's gonna be so very good. But then those seven years of prosperity followed by seven years of severe want and famine. Worst recession we've ever known. In fact, it'll be so bad, people won't remember the good years. So what does Pharaoh do right away as he receives this divine information? He raises taxes. Don't you love it when your leaders raise taxes? Yeah. Whoa. Ah. Yeah, I haven't got any love on that all weekend long. Um, none of us like that. He raises taxes 20%. 20, no, no, not, 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 wait, wait, not 20%, 20% of, of gross. So if you're paying at a 15% rate, now you're paying 35% rate, right? Can you imagine how unpopular that was? Now, again, you didn't vote kings in and out of office, but you could assassinate them. And historians tell us that his dynasty was not very popular to begin with, so it's kind of a risky move. But being a disciplined leader, he recognized they had to live on a margin. They had to set aside reserve because seven years of famine was coming. And Andy Stanley, who's great on this topic, says this, good disciplined leaders lead now like it was then. Oh, you missed that. I'll back up and say it to this crowd over here. Good disciplined leaders lead now like it was then. If you're disciplined in whatever you do in life, you have that, that view of the future, right? I'm gonna practice hard now because I wanna win then. Uh, I wanna have an A when my finals roll around, so let me study now like it was then, all right? So good leaders do that. They set aside the extra food, and the people probably couldn't figure out why. We got so much food, the government is so wealthy, they have this excess of grain, I can't believe it. When the famine hit, Egypt was the only nation not starving. In fact, they had managed the income so well that other nations came to Egypt to buy food. And the Egypt of the famine was more prosperous than the Egypt of the prosperity. Why? A disciplined leader did not tax and spend. He taxed and saved. Is that even possible? They're afraid to clap, by the way. Look, I, I'm... I'm not trying to take a political stand, one party or the other. I'm not trying to, I'm just, I, and I'm not an economist. There's probably all these dynamics and nuances I don't understand. I, I just, I've taken Financial Peace University. And no, I cannot run my budget the way we do things as a nation. And my concern is, uh, if you're a grown-up person, we're leaving this huge debt for our kids to deal with. And it's probably time as a people that we get disciplined on these issues. Amen? It's just a biblical thing to put aside margin. So I pray that whether Democrat or Republican for our leaders, they would have the courage to be disciplined. And if that made you uncomfortable, here's the last one will make you more uncomfortable. I'm praying that our next president would know how to disagree, know how to disagree, have strong convictions, disagree without being disagreeable. Is it just me or has this been the most hostile political season we've ever known? Oh, gosh, it, the rhetoric is fiery. There's character assassination. There's, there's name calling. I mentioned last week, if you're not watching the debates, forget the politics, you're missing great entertainment because, man, it's, it's crazy what's happening. It's often very, very mean-spirited. And, and this is probably something America cannot latch on to, but I pray we as God's people be different. It is so adversarial. And again, it doesn't matter what party you're talking about. It's, it's you know, Sanders versus Clinton, it's adversarial. Uh, Trump versus Cruz, adversarial. Batman versus Superman, adversarial, right? It's, it's, it's everywhere right now. And uh, I, I just think with people being so passionate and fired up and sometimes so mean and angry, as God's people, could we just be a little different? You see, we're to value truth as Christian people. Our gospel is truth. We traffic in the truth. But be careful how you share the truth. Ephesians chapter four says, tell the truth. Tell the truth. Tell the truth. Turn to your neighbor and say, tell the truth. 
tell the truth. Tell, don't be lying. Don't be shading the truth. Don't embellish for effect, right? Don't exact. You tell the truth. But it, the verse continues, say, but we tell the truth. That's the what. Here's the how. In love. That the nature of our conversation is just different. We're not angry. We're not, we're not name calling. We're not, we feel strongly, but we love first and speak truth second. Oh, you look like you're not convinced. Let me think of an example of the Bible of a leader who did this pretty well. Mm, who's the leader? Mm, Jesus. Jesus. Jesus was like a lot of things. One was he was a really good leader. This guy that never roamed more than 100 miles from the place of his birth has rocked the planet more than any other personality, more than any other leader or, or, or general or king, a rabbi, a carp, Jesus. What was the nature of his communication? Well, sometimes, rarely, he'd get fired up. You know, there's a couple of times he chased out money changers and stuff. Man, he got, he got people ripping off people in God's name. That, that got him a little mad. But typically, what was the disposition of Jesus' conversation? Love. Empathetic. Uh, Non-judgmental. Forgiving. Approachable. Kind. What happened to kind conversation? Some people say, oh, kindness, kind. You can't make your point if you're kind. You think kindness and weakness are synonymous? No, no, no. Kindness can be very strong. And by the way, I got a Bible verse. It says, be ye kind one to another. We're commanded as God's people. The nature of our conversation is different. I'm watching the debate. I want to tell you what part. I'm watching the debate in the room, and Zane, my seven-year-old, in the room playing with Legos. All of a sudden, he hears these people going off on each other. He looks up, looks at the TV, looks at me, looks at the TV, looks at me. He said, Daddy, they have bad manners. And I'm thinking, yeah, you would go to time out if I saw you speaking to someone like that. So the whole nation may not latch on to this, but as God's people, as Jesus' people, can we follow his example and be strong, yet respectful and honor? You see, um, we're going to do this 90s series. It's going to be a lot of fun in the 90s. This is a great decade. Well, I was a young guy just starting out in ministry in the 90s, and I was trying to find my voice as a speaker. And it seemed like as, as a young man coming out of grad school that most of the communicators in the Christian community that were celebrated were these, these real passionate, fiery, kind of mad, angry guys. They would kind of say things in the most sensational, even inflammatory way they could. Just, and that was kind of in vogue. And I'm trying to figure out how should I be as a communicator. I remember watching this, this guy on TV, and he was called God's Angry Young Man. I thought that's the way you get up. Yeah. And then I found this verse in John chapter 12. John chapter, the speaker is the greatest leader ever. It's Jesus. John 12, 49. No verse is affected more the way I preach than the statement of Jesus. Here's, here's what he does and how he did it. He says, I do not speak of my own accord, but the Father who sent me. Jesus, guess what? I don't make this stuff up as I go. This is my information. It's my Father's information. It aligns with the Old Testament, so I speak God's word, but the Father who sent me commanded me what? That's the truth. That's the content. That's the substance. Our message is substantial. Commanded me what to say and how. And you think about the nature of his speech. Typically, he is kind. He is loving. He is forgiving. He is understanding. There's a woman at the well, and she's a mess. She has screwed up her life. She's messed up people's marriages, and he's... He, he respects her and he honors her. A prostitute comes and washes his wheat at feet of the home of a, a Pharisee, and the Pharisee's outraged, and Jesus is so kind. Can we have a passion for the truth and still have a passion for people? As God's people, may we be marked by our manners in this season of political discussion. Some things to think about, some things to think about. I think you should think about these things. You think about your vote in November. I don't care if you're a donkey person. I don't care if you're an elephant person, be an American person, caring about our country, praying God's wisdom, praying for leaders you agree with, leaders you don't agree with. And what a blessing. We get to choose our leader. For most of history, kings. And kings, of course, ascended the throne, didn't care about popular consent. I mean, bloodline, bloodshed. You didn't pick your kings, vote on kings. You just got stuck with a king. In fact, of all of history, I only think of one glaring exception. There's one king that allows you to elect him, King Jesus. And I got to land the thing right here. Because though Jesus is the king of the universe, and someday every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess the sound of his name, as far as your life, 
It allows you to choose who sits on the throne of your life. We've been talking about being a Christian person for several weeks. If you're newer with us, you know how how to be saved, how to be saved. And I think the Bible's clearest word on salvation is Romans 10, verse 9. At all of our campuses, it's on the screen right now. And I want you to to, to look where it lands. Look, Look at the last four words in this verse. It says, if you do what this verse says, there's two things in this verse. You do these two things, comma, you will be saved. That's it. What does saved mean? Saved is all those good God things. It means uh, your sin's forgiven. It means no guilt. It means no shame. It means God does not just accept you. He adopts you into his family as his daughter or as his son. Is that incredible? He gives you his Holy Spirit. He gives you his purpose, his peace. It all qualifies you for a heaven. All that stuff happens when you're saved. And this verse promises you, not my promise, God's promise. If you do this, you will be saved. So how are you saved? Well, it's two things. One is faith. Faith. The verse we're gonna talk about, you must have faith, believe that Christ is risen from the dead. And maybe you're new around here and you've got a litany of questions and God issues, but you probably have some faith. You probably have some degree of belief in how much faith you need to be saved. What Jesus said, if you have the faith the size of a mustard seed, a little tiny seed, you can move mountains. Do you have a speck of faith? I know you got questions and issues, but do you believe just a a little bit, maybe more than a little bit, that that Christ kept his promise, he is the Messiah, he is risen from the dead? Wow, that's saving faith right there. And then there's nothing we do to add to salvation. There's nothing we do to add to faith, but there's a way that faith always expresses itself. Who sits on the throne of your life? Look at the verse, what it says. It says that if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is and then believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Let's talk about this idea of Lord, because that's not a word we use outside of a religious context anymore. But back in the day, if, if your heritage is English, that was a word that people used in culture. How'd they use it? Well, you, you know, you've, you've seen a movie before. You've seen some movie about King Arthur and his knights or, or Robin Hood, and, and the king goes riding by, and the knight bows down to the king and says, you are my Lord. Now, what the knight is not saying, he's not saying, hey, look, it's Jesus on the horse. Hey, Messiah. No, no, no. What he's saying is this. He's saying, Lord, meaning you are the king, and I serve you. You rule and reign, and I submit and obey. You see, Jesus is the only king who allows you to choose if he can sit on the throne of your life. So, So how do you make the choice? Well, the same way in November, a lot of us will vote. You know, you'll go to a voting place, there'll be a voting booth, and you'll make, you'll make a simple choice, and you'll have a ballot. And on the ballot, it will have some names, and you kind of pick one name, who's going to lead, you know, America. Imagine the same thing right now is happening. You're in, you're in the spiritual voting booth, and there's, there's a ballot, and the ballot has one question. Who sits on the throne of your life? It has your name, and it has the name of Jesus. And today, you're going to vote. Today, you're going to make a simple choice. David, is it really that easy? I think it's that easy. Joshua said, choose for yourself today who you will serve. But as for me and my house, we will choose to serve the Lord. He wants to sit on the throne. He's a kind king. He will bless you in many ways, but he will not force his leadership into your life. He allowed you to vote him into spiritual office. And there's someone today, man, God has your number. You thought you'd have it all figured out, probably need a degree in theology, memorize half the Old Testament, and then you'd be qualified to be a Christian. No, a mustard seed of faith can save you. And that faith translates not into perfection. You can't promise perfection. You can't deliver that. But Lord, from now on, you're the king. And with joy, I want to learn and serve you. Well, David, how do I put all that together? Well, it says in the same chapter, Romans 10, verse 13, for everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. So at every campus, I, I don't want anyone to leave early. I don't want any, I know there's somebody, man, oh, I, I, I'm very important, I got a schedule, I work for the president, I'm, I'm the chief of the CIA. Guess what, you're okay, he'll be fine for just a few minutes, you stay there. Nobody leave early, any campus, but I want everyone to stand right now. And for someone, this is your moment. This is your day. You're in the spiritual 
voting booth and you're gonna choose who's gonna sit on the throne of your life and someone's gonna be so smart and discerning and you're gonna choose to make Jesus your Savior and your Lord, the King of your life. I wanna lead you in a prayer of salvation. Now there's no need to pray out loud because God's a genius, he can read your mind. But if today as every head bows and every eye is closed at every campus, if you wanna be saved, pray something like this. Pray something like, um, okay Jesus, yeah, I, I'm saying yes. I, I didn't plan on this being my day, but I, I recognize this is my next step. I thought my faith was too small, it was insufficient, but I have a mustard seed of faith. Now we both know I still got a bunch of questions, but right now I'm making a choice and I'm choosing to believe that Christ is risen and he's the Messiah. He died on the cross to pay for my sins. He arose again. And he's alive right now, so I have faith in a risen Savior. And now on top of that, I make you the Lord of my life. Here's the throne. I vacate the throne. I willingly give it to you. I want to serve you all of my days, throughout all of my life. And when my life on earth is through, I'll spend forever with my King in heaven. For I make this salvation prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah, put your hands together. Wow, wow, because at every campus, people all over the room have prayed that prayer for the first time with understanding. And maybe this is you. Maybe you prayed that prayer. You never really prayed that prayer before. You're like, whoa, okay. What now? What do I do? Here's a thought. Right now, only you and God know that you were just saved. And that's just way too good to keep to yourself. You need to tell somebody. You need to let somebody know. So here's some thoughts. Maybe tell the person that brought you. Hey, hey, Bob, you brought me to church. I prayed that prayer with David. What? And they need to talk with you. If you think, I need, I need some more understanding. Look at the, the stage. There's some nice people at the edge of the stage right now. They're prayer partners. And if you want to talk with someone, it'll take like five, ten minutes. They'll show you some verses, some promises in God's Word. At your campus, there's prayer partners at the edge of the stage. You just have the courage to say, hey, I prayed that prayer. They will not grill you or embarrass you, but they'll show you those verses. You can walk out of this room knowing with confidence things are cool between you and your heavenly father and you are a saved child of the king you're a citizen perhaps of america but you're surely a citizen of the kingdom of god in eternity and that is something to celebrate let somebody know come back next week we're rocking the 90s week ones are always fun father god we love you and we celebrate the king of kings and the lord of lords we make this prayer in jesus name as the church says together amen